Hey there, this is Sarah, the host of Trending Globally. And this is Dan, Trending Globally's producer. And we just wanted to say, if you like what you hear, you can get more conversations just like this by subscribing to Trending Globally on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you've already subscribed, please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps others find us. All right. Enjoy the show. From the Watson Institute at Brown University, this is Trending Globally. I'm Sarah Baldwin. I'm going to take a guess. In the last few months, you've probably tried to buy a face mask, latex gloves, or maybe some other piece of what we've all learned to call personal protective equipment, PPE for short. And you've probably noticed these items are in short supply. And more distressing than that, hospitals are having a hard time buying them too. On this episode, we're going to take you on a tour of one of the most essential supply chains in the global economy, that of medical equipment and PPE. And we're going to look at what happens when a pandemic turns everyone into a customer. There's no better guest to help us make sense of all this than George Barrett. Among other roles in the healthcare and pharmaceutical industries, George is the former chairman and CEO of Cardinal Health, one of the world's largest manufacturers and distributors of medical products. Watson's director, Ed Steinfeld, talked with George for the podcast about the economics, politics, and science of PPE and medical equipment. Their conversation sheds a light not just on our healthcare system during this pandemic, but on our global economy in the year 2020. Here's Ed. George, welcome to Trending Globally. Thanks for having me, Ed. So in, in normal times, what does the supply chain for personal protective equipment look like? Who are the players and how do the transactions work? So it might be um, helpful first to define what we think of as personal protective equipment. So there is protective equipment that's technically medical devices. These are regulated either class two, typically class two or class one medical devices. Um, these include things like gowns and gloves and drapes. So I'm going to make that distinction because as we've come through this crisis, we've had a lot of confusion about what are actually devices that are medical devices regulated by the Food and Drug Administration and other bodies around the world, and what are gear that we use that are barriers. So I want to make sure I identify that distinction now because it's become important recently. Um, in the normal flow of events, let me just go through the players. So we have producers. These producers are all over the world. But I will say for many of the products that we've been talking about, gowns, drapes, gloves, masks, many of them are uh, produced in East Asia. There are the raw materials and the components that go into these products. Um, that's on the production side. Let's stay with the United States for the moment. There are companies that are what I would call the traditional healthcare distribution companies. And those products distribute healthcare products, everything from medical devices to lab equipment to pharmaceutical products. Now, I will say that some medical products like these go directly from manufacturer to hospitals. Uh, many of them flow through these distribution companies. And then, of course, there are the hospitals and the healthcare providers. Uh, hospitals, our fleet, uh, the VA system, et cetera. These are the uh, customers uh, and the, the healthcare providers that, that are using these products. There is another player that we see in the mix in um, regular times and during this crisis as well, which are sort of group purchasing organizations. And um, those uh, groups um, came to being many years ago, largely to help what were nonprofit, not for profit hospitals. Those are the traditional players in the system. And in normal times, what, what does the ordering process look like? Does a healthcare system place an order every month, every year? Is it very predictable? Yes. Again, the ordering frequency is very high. Um, part of that really relates to um, sort of a, a trend that we started to see several decades ago with the sort of just-in-time inventory. Uh, and so the entire system, the entire supply chain in some ways adapted to this model of management of flow of materials and logistics. As you know, it came, uh, became most famous in Toyota and in the Japanese manufacturing world. And the whole idea was to um, use the flow of data um, to efficiently produce two uh, signals of demand and to reduce the amount of inventory in the system. 
in many ways, that's been for decades an incredibly efficient way for the system to work. In a crisis, it's turned out to be quite a challenge. So um, uh, products are delivered daily. So companies like the company I ran, Cardinal Health, is delivering to thousands of hospitals every day, in some cases more than once a day. So very, very regular flow of products into these hospital systems. Right, but it sounds great. I mean, no slack resources, no inventory, margins that are really narrow. But I guess when demand spikes, all kinds of craziness breaks out. It seemed as a lay observer, I, I, I watched what seemed to be all kinds of new buyers jumping in and in a way, a kind of a frenzy for equipment. What, what happened when the, when the pandemic broke out? Yeah, so as, as I, I described, again, with some exceptions, again, there are moments where the system has been difficult, but fundamentally over the last 50 years, this system has run relatively efficiently uh, for the healthcare system. This crisis has been um, extraordinary in so many different ways. And uh, first, let's talk about uh, demand. So demand surged in a way that um, no system, at least here in the United States or anywhere in the world, was able to really navigate. Again, the demand was global and explosive. We're talking about volumes that, for example, on a given day for some of these products could look like either a very large month or in some cases a year. So just extraordinary demand. Imagine, again, in a hospital, you're not just providing products to the physicians that are in the front line or working in the ICU. You're talking about people in transport in the hospital, people that are working in the warehouse or the loading docks. So everyone needed equipment and production. And they were replenishing or, or having to dispose of this very regularly as this surge um, really accelerated. And we saw this quite dramatically in New York. So again, just extraordinary demand globally, drawing essentially on the same sources of global demand. And now comes this important distinction about medical products. These, the products that normally that we use in uh, these healthcare institutions are regulated medical devices. And so there, there aren't that many producers in the world that have the capacity and the regulatory approvals to do this kind of work. And so the surge was an enormous drain on a system not designed to handle that kind of capacity coming in on a global basis. And George, I think about even myself and my own family, we wanted surgical masks to protect ourselves. So I'm guessing that in addition to the traditional buyers of these medical devices, you had all manner of other kind of buyer jump in, everything from the you know box stores to individuals. Now, again, remember, there is a non-medical device industry that produces um, things like masks and gloves, and you can buy those at, at retail stores. Everybody wanted protection here, understandably. This, was, this has been and continues to be an enormous crisis. And so I think what we saw was um, hoarding. Uh, again, it's it's a word that has a very negative connotation, but I think we have to accept the fact that this is a natural thing that happens in a shortage, which is those who are seeing signals of surge suddenly dr dramatically increase their orders. They want to build up inventory. At least trying to access or make sure their orders are in place. So when we saw a surge in orders, and second, now we have consumers understandably uh, frightened. And in those early days, remember, with ambiguous signals as to whether or not they should be taking certain protective measures to... Um, measures to protect themselves. So I think with ambiguous signals, a supply system under enormous duress, and some confusion about which products should be used in the medical setting and which products should be used in sort of the consumer setting, we had a recipe for a real, a real challenge. Um, add to that, um, we had lots of um, players who wanted to help and who wanted to protect their own institutions and the people that are working in, right in the front line in those institutions. So we had states and hospital systems and um, philanthropists and everyone who wanted to help jumping in to say, we can help, we have a source of products that we can uh, provide you with. The reality was, at least in those early weeks, there was only so much medical grade supply available. And so when each of those individual entities started saying, look, we have a source in China that we will go to directly because we've got some contacts in China. If it was a regulated medical device, 
it was probably grabbing the same inventory that one of the traditional companies that was that does this daily work was expecting to get. And so actually what it did inadvertently, again, all well-intentioned and all done by people. I shouldn't say all, oh, we're going to come back to the, the bad <laughs> actors that, that emerge in these moments. But much of it done by people really trying to help with a sense of, um, of urgency. Um, that created an interesting and more challenging dynamic because it started driving up the price of the medical grade products. It also started driving up the price of products that are not medical grade. It also attracted players who occasionally in these moments are there to exploit this situation. And we've seen thousands of examples of, um, quote, agents or brokers who were saying, look, give me money up front. I will get you these products. Um, and in many cases, those were fraudulent. Just as a frame of reference, Ed, I was talking to some of my former colleagues because what I'd retired from my work, uh, but of course, calls were coming to me to say, look, we've got this uh, source of supply. Uh, we want to make sure that it gets in the system. So I would reach out to some of the players that do this on a daily basis. Um, and I was doing that so that they could do the vetting. At one point, I checked in to see how it was going. And I was told that um, they had vetted over 700 incoming offers, four of which had any legitimacy where they could actually act on these. So the amount of frenzy that was occurring, um, some of it productive, but much of it not, I think added to the complexity. Again, that's not to blame those trying to help. But I think what we need to do at some point as we really do a lessons learned is ask, you know, so what are the things that we would do to prevent those kinds of dynamics occurring? And that's sort of an interesting question in terms of policy and economics. What do you do to prevent those kinds of black market or gray markets from emerging? Yeah, even if we take out the bad actors, and surely there's some of them, even if we think about relatively benevolent actors on the on the demand side and the supply side, I guess that when things get so tight and uncertain on the demand side, legitimate buyers probably put in duplicative orders to different suppliers to guarantee that something comes in. The suppliers then have to guess which order is a valid one, which is just a duplication. And meanwhile, the price is getting bid up. So it sounds like just the whole price mechanism and supply and demand signals got completely distorted. I think that's right. Um, it is a natural behavior. And in fact, in some cases, the systems are designed, if you're having a shortage and you're not getting that replenishment stock, to reorder, right? So so the system probably becomes uh, somewhat gummed up. And um, I think this is sort of a natural phenomenon. You know, in a, in, in a sense, it's a reminder that I think we have a tendency, all of us, to under-prepare for things that seem very unlikely, but have enormously high consequences. Um, this is a great example. It's, it's almost like a natural human tendency. And then when you add to that, the fact that we often have to spend money in the near term to anticipate something in the long term that may or may not happen that is highly consequential, that is something we don't do very well. And I really think that that's something we're gonna need to think about as a system. George, with the recent surge, did we discover any surprising bottlenecks in global supply chains? Yeah, I think that, um, put it this way, I'm not sure if we discovered, but it certainly exposed, the crisis exposed some challenges. Um, we, we have a tendency to think about all the products that we needed, ventilators and masks and test kits, et cetera. What I think people only began to learn about towards the tail end of the initial surge was, um, and of course the companies understood this, was that there are components that are needed. So there are what I would think of as sort of the long poles in the tent that are needed. You can't have a ventilator without having uh, filters. You can't have a test kit without swabs or reagents. Um, you can't have masks without access to, um, to uh, rubber or latex. And what we, what we know is that these products are, are often produced um, in, in, in relatively limited numbers of facilities around the world. Take swabs, for example. Most of our swabs were coming from Italy. So we had this enormous surge here in the US, but Italy was also experiencing a terrible crisis. And so trying to get those products um, exported to the US um, and produced in, in a necessary quantity were challenging. And I think that's one of the things that we need to think about is as we 
think and learn from this. What are those long poles in the tent? What are the things that we need that that make the system work? I'll give you another example that, again, people wouldn't necessarily think about. When patients go into the ICU and they're going to go on a ventilator, they need to be intubated. In order to be intubated, they're probably going to have to be sedated. The pharmaceuticals that are used to do that started getting into short supply. So again, it's going backwards and thinking about what are all the critical components that you need in one of these outbreaks and planning for those. And of course, over the years, some of this planning has been done, but we need to refresh that and we need to make sure we're really thinking carefully about all those component parts and creating a system that is more resilient and more flexible and responsive to surge than um, the, the somewhat rigid system that we've developed today. And certainly what you're suggesting is we need a lot more nuance in how we think about these supply chains rather than where is the product ultimately assembled. But there's all this nuance about what's going into the product. We do. And it's also, I think, it reminds us as we do sort of lessons learned on this, we have to be very careful to say the answer to this is making everything at home. Look, we've seen the challenges that in the pork industry, right? One facility has a problem and then we have a problem and that, uh, uh, for the nation and that was uh, here in the US. So I think the question is not just, of course, I think we need to bring more closer to home. I do think that's something that we'll need to, to explore and explore fully. But I think we really need to make sure that we have a system that's resilient. And we have to be reminded that we're in a moment of hyper-nationalism around the world. Um, there's just been reporting on that over the last couple of days about the pressures around vaccines to make sure that those vaccines produced or funded by a particular government stay first in that country and then maybe then can be exported. So I think these are particularly tricky um, situations or uh, moments when we have a world that is experiencing, you know, as much nationalism as, we, as we've experienced, you know, in a, in a very long time. And I think that we'll need to be very careful as we think about lessons learned and the right policy solutions to protect ourselves going forward. Is there a kind of a preparedness or flexibility that would involve companies that are not traditionally part of the supply system developing the ability to switch into it? I mean, we've heard about Ford and maybe some of the other automakers getting into the business of producing respirators. Is that a scalable kind of solution for flexibility? I actually think it is. Um, it is a, a capability that is appropriate and necessary in a crisis. I mean, World War II mobilization has been well documented. By the way, it wasn't overnight, right? We, we were not all that well prepared for, for Pearl Harbor and, and what uh, transpired afterwards. But we did mobilize and lots of industries had to repurpose their activities. And I think that we could do that um, maybe more effectively by actually thinking in advance about the various capabilities that are necessary. So let's take ventilators. I think the system did a good job, um, American industry did a good job of responding, not just American industry, of responding to that need for ventilators. Um, but again, there's ways of doing that more preparedness up front to say, what are the kinds of things that can happen, let's say, in a global healthcare crisis? What are the capabilities needed and who you could almost map who has comparable kinds of capabilities and they will be essentially part of a ongoing discussion as it relates to emergency preparedness. And I think that kind of planning is possible. I really do. And um, But again, it requires, um, I think, some centralized planning. And that is where we get into some is issues that I know, Ed, you and your Folks at Watson talk about, no doubt, a lot, which is the nature of government. What's the role of the federal government which it, versus what's the role of the states? And it does touch on those subjects. My view is in a crisis, uh, even those who believe that the states should have tremendous autonomy, and you're seeing that in the polling, people still believe that in a crisis, there is some need for the uh, central body uh, government uh, data source to, to, to help us navigate through. And I think that same group could do, do planning in coordination with, with all the states and with industry and with industry. Could you talk, George, a little bit more about what, say, government intervention, whether it's federal level or otherwise, wh what would intervention look like when a surge happens? And I also have in mind some of the equity issues. Is it the case, say, that 
a poor hospital system, if prices are being bid up, a poor hospital system can't access goods or a poor state or international, a poor country. So how, what, what would intervention look like and how might that intersect with the, the equity issues? Yeah, I think it's a, um, it's a great question and a tricky one, Ed. I think you almost have to do it situationally. I think we have a system that is designed to allow the states autonomy to, and to, to do their work in protecting their citizens. Having said that, depending on the nature of the crisis, there can be moments where I think the federal government uh, should uh, step in. And it's helpful to everyone, including industry. So in this case, for example, uh, there may have, be, have come a point where, let's say, the search, and we saw some of this, for PPE was becoming distorted, both in terms of supply and in price. And that may be a situation in which the federal government needs to step in, either as a purchaser or as a coordinator in some fashion. I think the situation you described was possible, which is worrisome. So in the crisis, in the, particularly in the early days, particularly as it hit New York, you had everyone trying to protect um, their uh, healthcare workers, their first responders, and their citizens. And because there were shortages, it is totally understandable that when someone would go to the state and say, I have a source available, or someone would go to a major hospital in that area or a board member of that major hospital and say, look, we've got a source available, that they would pursue that. It is also possible that a poor system or a poor a state with less resources would not have had that um, at their fingertips. Now, as I said, as it turns out, may have been grabbing from the same source of supply. It's, it's hard to say. But there is no question that that inadvertently started to inflate prices. And again, this was all done, I think, because people were trying to take care of, of, of their healthcare workers, do their job, and take care of their citizens. But these are the moments where maybe it's necessary for there to be some intervention to help prevent that from becoming a crisis and for exacerbating inequities. It also seems that when something that resembles panic sets in and when people are scrambling for resources to move people out of that mode, there's just a degree of societal trust that's needed and a degree of leadership. And I want to ask you really about your view of leadership under these circumstances, whether in terms of are there other countries and societies that have done this better or are there um, particular players or examples of leadership you could think of in the U.S. system that kind of reflects a, a, a possible solution? You know, I think, um, again, I'm going to touch on a subject that the Watson Institute uh, no doubt spends uh, plenty of time researching and, and teaching about, which is, you know, democracy is messy in some ways. And so, uh, you know, in a crisis, uh, as it turns out, authoritarian regimes, uh, because uh, there is a central body making uh, decisions, whether that is one that people get a chance to weigh in on not, or not, you know, there, there can be a response as a, as a strange paradoxical byproduct that, that we would say uh, can be useful in a crisis. My view, uh, having a democracy is, is a precious thing. It does highlight some challenges in leadership in these moments. And I think uh, crisis tends to amplify uh, leadership characteristics, probably good and bad in all of us. And it does call for, call for certain things. Um, trust, you just mentioned trust. I think it's an enormously important issue because especially in a world in which information is flowing freely and very rapidly through the internet and through a 24-hour news cycle, we are getting bombarded with information, uh, much of it not curated. And it's very hard for people to understand what the truth is, whatever that means. And is there a single source of truth and a trusted source. And I think those moments are exacerbated by crisis. And I think those moments are exacerbated by the nature of the world that we live in today. Um, I think FDR would have had a bigger challenge if he had to deal with a 24 hour news cycle and the internet. And so I think um, this highlights some issues. I think uh, constant communication, um, transparent, factual, communication so that it feels like there is a single source of truth. In this particular case, the truth has actually changed a lot. We are learning. We are learning about this virus, about its biology, about our ability to respond um, in the moment. And I think there is a need for a constant um, 
very frequent communication about what we know, where we're getting that information from, and and how we're going to respond to that. So clarity, um, a real clear sense of mission. What is it that we are trying to do? And I think from the leader, um, this sense that I will do everything in my power to protect you. Everything that I can do to protect you. And that means um, surrounding myself with the best and brightest, um, empowering them to do extraordinary work, um, uh, making sure that um, no boundaries, political, historical agreements, nothing will get in the way of, of that. So this clarity and mission, a consistency of messaging, I think this issue of trust that connects to all that, which is these are all trust builders. And I think also in a really difficult moment like this, um, the ability to demonstrate empathy. Uh, tons has been written about this. Um, but I do think that this has been a, an extraordinarily uh, painful thing for um, you know millions of people. And um, there are so many people that are feeling this sense. It is important for the leader to be able to acknowledge the loss. And um, the ability to at least attempt to say, I am trying to put myself in your shoes and acknowledge that loss is important for the leader. At the same time, the leader needs to be decisive in these moments and the leader needs to be able to try to paint a picture coming out of it on what, uh, what life looks like, that we do see something uh, at the end of this and that we do have brighter days ahead. But I do think uh, trying to minimize, pretend that it's not a, a challenge is, is really uh, difficult for people. And that, that destroys trust. I mean, for all of the complexities of American culture, it, it seems clear that the U.S. and U.S. society is capable of a lot of innovation, whether it's the kind of Silicon Valley entrepreneurial innovation or the kind of big national mobilization, mobilization of science technology that happened during World War II and afterward. I'm, I'm hoping that the current crisis will be a driver of a new wave or new waves of innovation. Do, how do you foresee that playing out? What are the possibilities for innovation in the supply chains or innovation in healthcare generally? You know, I think um, these moments uh, challenge us in so many different ways. But again, I think history tells us there are moments, these moments where it forces us to uh, use a different lens or to reevaluate what we're doing or the way we're doing it. And it does have a tendency, we do have a tendency to see innovation in these moments. I can think of some very specific examples uh, during this crisis. Um, we saw a hometown company of my, my work in Columbus, Ohio, which is Battelle, which is the research institute that, as you know, Leet runs a number of our national labs. Um, they developed an extraordinary uh, capability to repurpose existing medical supplies and sterilize those at very large scale. And that they were able to deploy that very, very quickly. Again, pure innovation. Um, we've seen innovation around um, the, the development of how vaccines are done. Again, the use of RNA uh, vaccines. And again, this is very early on, but we're seeing now hundreds of uh, vaccines in development, a number of which are already in, in clinical trials, using different technologies. Instead of saying, look, we're going to use the old technology and try to squeeze all the, the timelines of those, why don't we rethink the entire process? Now, again, that didn't happen just because of the crisis, but the crisis accelerated that work. The use of telemedicine. Telemedicine wasn't invented during this crisis, but this crisis has created sort of a tipping point where we're now realizing that telemedicine used in particular ways can be extremely valuable. I also think it's going to um, it's going to force us to ask some questions about our healthcare system. So, for example, for years we've been saying we have too many beds in in the United States, thousands of too many hospitals, too many beds. Well, as it turns out, in a crisis, we may have too many of the wrong kinds of beds. And so we may need to ask ourselves, what are hospitals really for? And I would think, and this trend started really some time ago, but I think this is going to be accelerated, is that hospitals are likely to be more for truly sick people. And this requires that we stop using hospitals as a primary care facility, which requires us to think a little bit about access to health care. So I think, as I think about this as a healthcare person, I think there are certain changes that are going to be very concrete. I think there are certain innovations that are likely to result from this. There are certain things that are just going to be a blip. They're probably not going to change our behavior long term. We're just going to have to wrestle through the crisis. 
And then there are other areas that are going to force us to rethink some important aspects of the way we deliver care. It sounded as if when you were talking about the research surrounding vaccines and also your mention of Battelle, that you're talking about a lot of different players, some of whom are fully in the commercial space, they're commercial companies. Others are in public spaces, they're national laboratories or university research organizations. Could you say a word about how in these hopefully innovative times, some of these public and private players interact? I'm a big believer that there is great opportunity for public-private partnership. We have an extraordinary uh, industry uh, in healthcare and, and in other industries in this country. And I think that that requires, again, a fair amount of trust um, between the public sector and the private sector. But I think we've seen it, um, whether or not the Defense Production Act was, you know, triggered at, at, at the right moment is, is an interesting question. And again, we'll have a chance to review that as we, I think, do these lessons learned in terms of sort of forcing certain activities from industry. But I do think there are a lot of industries that were stepping up. And I was literally getting calls saying, Here's an idea that we have. How can we do that? And so I think that there's opportunity for us to reimagine how we do certain things. If, in fact, there are certain activities that are hard to do in the public sector, let's say the funding cycles don't work, maybe those are areas in which we can partner with industry uh, to do them. There may be other areas where the industry says, look, this is not something that we can do without government uh, involvement or government support or government guidance on, as I said, allocation methodologies. And um, so I think this interchange between uh, government and the private sector can be really positive. I know there are reasons that um, people can feel concerned about, you know, that, that connection being too tight. But my experience is that I've seen some really positive ways in which uh, the private sector and the public sector can work together. And I've seen this happen with states. The examples in Ohio, really, really good um, uh, coordination. We saw the state do a, um, a deal with a, a laboratory um, company to be able to map, heat map where certain pieces of equipment were so they can move them to the critical areas. So I do think that we've seen examples in this at the state level and some at the federal level of, of demonstrating where the public and the private sector can work together. Right. And with both um, Republican and Democratic no governors. It's also interesting, I, I think, that states have been working with each other as well, regionally and uh, working across borders. I think that's really, again, for all these difficult and um, tragic moments, you know, I keep trying to think about what are the things that are encouraging uh, in this difficult time, watching governors, many of whom have different ideological views, different views on the role of government, watching some of these governors work together regionally. Again, I use New York and Ohio as an example. One Republican governor, one Democratic governor, um, both uh, working their tails off to try to protect the people of, of their states and uh, and uh, work with health systems to to make them safe and to make them productive. So, you know, I th th there's a lot to, to be worried about uh, in this crisis, but I also try to think about what are the things that we can learn, both negative and positive. And I think we've demonstrated that um, the public and private sector can work together, that, that, that states can work together, that regions can work together. And uh, I, I'd like to see more of that happening. I really like that point. And to your earlier point that a lot of the discourse is about international versus domestic, should we fully um, uh, reshore supply chains? It seems like, well, within the country too, there are a lot of boundaries. There's the federal, local, there's the boundaries across states. But I think what you're demonstrating is with the right kinds of cooperation, the right kinds of transparency, the right kinds of data and the right kinds of trust, those barriers can be transcended. I think they can. And I think we can also use this as a learning uh, Look, we know that there are other risks that exist out there. It's not just uh, infectious disease. It's um, impact of climate change. So we have certain parts of our country and certain regions that, are, um, that may be at risk. This would be a great time for us to be thinking about having those governors talking to other governors to say, look, in the event that something happens and talking to industry, what are the things that we might think about in advance? And so... There are going to have to be some very tough lessons learned from this experience, um, and some of them tragic. There are also some lessons learned that can inform us going forward. And it's not just about infectious disease. It's about how do we respond 
in a moment of crisis. And there are other kinds of challenges that we face. And um, I would hope that this is a moment where we can not only reflect on the negative lessons learned and fixing those and anticipating those, but also some of the lessons, the, the positive lessons where we might be able to say, actually, there's something that we can draw on in the event that we have a future event. And let's start planning for that. George Barrett, I really appreciate your leadership on these issues, your wisdom. I appreciate your illuminating us in this conversation and, and showing us a, a real path to, to the future. Thank you. Glad to be with you. Thanks. This episode of Trending Globally was produced by Dan Richards and Babette Thomas. Our theme music is by Henry Bloomfield. I'm Sarah Baldwin. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app. If you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review on iTunes. It really helps others find the show. For more information about this and other shows, go to watson.brown.edu. Thanks for listening, and tune in in two weeks for another episode of Trending Globally.